Just a little bit of background to refresh ourselves and remember that Paul's mission in this city of Thessalonica was brought to an abrupt end when a public riot and legal pressure and threats became so serious that it forced Paul and the missionaries that were with him to flee the city at night. And because Paul had left, his critics took full advantage of his absence in order to undermine his character and discredit the message. That was their strategy to launch a sort of smear campaign against Paul since he was no longer there. And this is interesting to know because this becomes one of the main reasons that Paul writes this letter of 1 Thessalonians, two of the chapters, in the way that we have it divided, two of the chapters are devoted to Paul's defense for his own ministry and his character. That's the section that we're reading now in chapters two and three. This part of Paul's letter is all about defending how he acted and who he was among them. And so, Here we have, in these words that we've read, Paul's defense against the insinuation that he had some sort of ulterior motives when he came. And the interesting thing is you study this this week, as many of you will in your little blue books and in your small groups and as you read, I hope that you will be in the word daily and gathering together throughout the week to encourage one another and pray for one another. But as you study Paul's words, what's so interesting is you can sort of reconstruct or reverse engineer what the accusations were against Paul. In his answers, you can get a sense for what the accusations were. And and here's basically what they would sound like. People were accusing Paul of running away. That's why he left. And obviously, since he hasn't been here, he wasn't really sincere. Obviously, Paul's motives, they would have said, were suspect. He's just, he's just another fake teacher traveling along the Ignatian way, looking for money or for sex or popularity or whatever. And as soon as there's trouble or as soon as there's opposition, he's gone. That's, that's what Paul's critics were saying. And so the insinuation to the Thessalonians, this brand new little group of believers called a church, the insinuation was, Paul doesn't really care about you. He doesn't care about you. He's just in it for himself. He's abandoned you. All he really cares about is himself. Now, here's the interesting thing. The fact of Paul's departure and Paul's failure to return seemed to fit the accusations, right? I mean, if you're one of the Thessalonian believers, you're probably hearing all this going, yeah, where is Paul? Where did he go? Maybe he is just a big chicken. Maybe, maybe he is just in it for himself. And no doubt it would have been hard to shake off the questions that were being suggested in such a subtle but sinister way undermining Paul's character. And no doubt, it would have been painful for Paul to get word that this is what's being said about him. And so, Paul responds here in this letter to the accusations. And here's the thing that I think is important to point out. It's it's not so much that Paul's concerned about his own reputation in and of itself. In fact, in In almost every letter that Paul writes, this is a big part of what he has to do. He has to defend his character. He has to defend his ministry. But not because Paul is so consumed with his own reputation. Paul's motive is clearly because he knows that the acceptance of the gospel that he's preached and the future of the church is depending on their decision as to whether or not they will believe these accusations, right? So they hear the accusations against Paul and they have to decide whether it's true or not. And depending on what they decide, 
has everything to do with whether or not the church is there for very long. And so Paul writes with great passion to the church to defend his ministry among them and his integrity and his character so that it doesn't discredit the message of the gospel. We know this in our own day, don't we? That there are many preachers, unfortunately, in very public places of visibility that are proclaiming this message, and there is such a strong reaction when it comes out that their life is not in line with the message that they preach. It does such harm to the message of the gospel and to the church when those who proclaim this message and profess to believe and to live by it are exposed as being frauds. And so Paul needs to make sure that the church knows that he was not insincere, that he was, in fact, genuine. And if you're a, if you're a note taker, an outline, that helps me sometimes to follow the flow of the passage. Verses 1 through 16 of chapter 2 that we've just read is Paul reminding the Thessalonians in so many ways how he behaved when he was with them. He's reminding them, you know... <laughs> You know how we lived among you. You know how we worked night and day. You know how we shared not only the message but ourselves. We were open to you. We lived with you. You saw us. You got to observe. In fact, one of the interesting features of this chapter is how many times Paul says, you know, you know, you know, you were witnesses. You know, you saw. Over and over again, Paul's reminding them of their own experience which is always amazing to me that someone can come along and whisper an accusation and somehow it can cancel out our own experience. You can ask someone, well, has that been your experience? And they're like, well, no, but now I'm wondering. Paul has to remind them, is this what you experienced of me when I was with you? And of course, he can point to his sincerity. So Paul appeals to one, his own openness, the way that he lived among them, and two, his suffering as proof of his sincerity. All through these words, Paul is pointing to the ways that he lived sacrificially and suffered for their sakes. He wasn't gaining anything. It was a difficult task that God had called him to, and yet Paul did it Willingly, and in so doing, it proves his sincerity. So one of the questions that we can ask when we come to this passage is, where did Paul draw the strength to suffer like he did and persevere? If that's some of the proof that Paul provides for his sincerity in the ministry, we might wonder, where did that strength come from? Because Paul suffered a lot, that's unquestionable. When you know and read about his life, it's, it's quite remarkable what Paul suffered for the sake of the gospel. And so remarkable that it's like, man, we just think of Paul on this other plane, like he's almost not human, he's a superhero or something. It's crazy what he went through and what he endured. How and where did Paul draw this strength? to persevere like he did in the midst of such suffering? And the answer is quite surprising, I think. There's probably a lot of answers, but the one that I wanna look at with you this morning from this text is in this. Paul knew that much of the power of the Christian life comes from imitating. Paul was an imitator, and this pattern of his life that he was following, of the one that he was imitating, was what kept Paul on course, unshakable and undeterred in the face of great opposition. How else could Paul say what he said in the opening verses here of chapter two? Read them again with me. He says, you yourselves know, brothers, there it is, you know, you experienced that our coming to you was not in vain. 
But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Paul's reminding the Thessalonians that he didn't come to them from, you know, a hotel suite and a two-week vacation before his mission trip. He came from Philippi where he was stripped naked in the middle of the city by a mob and beaten and thrown in prison. Even though he was a Roman citizen, his rights were violated. There was no trial. It was an awful experience, a painful experience. It was the kind of experience that most people would conclude after an experience like that, you know what? I don't think we've got the message right. Because people aren't really responding that great to it. And we roll into Philippi, we preach the gospel, the good news, and they like beat us up and throw us in jail and riot and kick us out. So imagine the five day, hundred mile journey to Thessalonica and you're there with your mission like, hey, I think we need to find a new strategy when we get to this next city. This isn't going so well, to say the least. Honestly, how many of us would keep going with this message in hand having been treated like that? But here's the crazy thing. Paul is undeterred. He is not thrown off course like so many of us are when we suffer. We think something's wrong. Something's not right. I must be missing something because surely if I was getting this right, it would be going better. But Paul could draw strength knowing he was not off course because he knew that he was following in the pattern of Jesus. See, here's the secret to Paul's strength and perseverance. Paul was imitating the life of Jesus purposefully. Paul saw in the life of Jesus a pattern for his own life to be lived after. And so in Paul's suffering, Paul would not think something's wrong. Paul would think to himself, Well, Jesus suffered. Jesus was treated this way. And he's not only my savior, but my Lord, my master. He's the one who's called me and counted me worthy to be in this ministry. He's the one that's entrusted me with this message. So I'm not thrown off course. I'm not shaken. See, it's amazing. It's amazing What people can endure in life in terms of suffering when they know where they're going and when they know that they'll get there if they keep going. Where we struggle is in the midst of our suffering when we start to feel lost and the doubts creep in and we wonder, am I going the right way? Because this is awful. And I don't want to keep going this way if I'm not going the right way. So we're looking for some sort of assurance. Is this the way? Is this the way that it should be? Is this how the Christian life should feel? Should there be this opposition? Should there be this conflict? Should there be this struggle? Should there be this battle where the spirit wars against the flesh and everything in the word of God says, yes, that's all part of it. And part of the comfort that you constantly hear from Paul to the early churches is reassuring them. And and understand this because it sounds strange. He's reassuring them, you will suffer. You will suffer. To follow Christ is to share in his sufferings. Don't be shaken. Don't be confused. Don't be thrown off by this. It's all part of it. To imitate Christ, to follow Christ, to pattern our lives after the life of Christ is to expect suffering. Dallas Willard writes uh, somewhat about this and 
He says, do we really imagine that following after Jesus and what we will experience and even endure will happen with less effort than learning to ride a bike or play an instrument? Some of us do. We think, well, this is hard. I don't like this. This is dumb. I've told you this story before when I met Kara when we were dating. We, were, we met on this trip to Mexico and she said, hey, teach me how to play the guitar. I said, okay. So I put my arms around here. You hold it like this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't do that. I was too much of a chicken for that. I didn't even talk to her the whole week. I just looked at her from a distance, but I thought she was out of my league. So, but she, she talked to me and said, hey, teach me how to play the guitar. And so I said, okay. And the way that I was taught, I really taught myself. I had one lesson and my dad said, here's three chords. When you learn them, come see me. And I just found a book that had a bunch of songs that I could play with those three chords because most worship songs, here's a little secret. They only have three chords. So I was like, cool. So I could play like thousands of worship songs with D-A-G. <laughs> so... Um, Anyways, I said, hey, Kara, here's D-A-G. Let me show you. When you've got this down, come back and see me. (laughs) She came back like two days later, but not to keep learning guitar. She's like, this is dumb and you're a bad teacher and I don't like this. (laughs) She's like, you taught me how to play, but I I can't play like you. This is stupid. I'm like, you've been doing it for two days. I used to sit up in my room for hours and my fingers would bleed from the steel strings just because I wanted to learn. I loved it. It was doing something to me to, to play music and to begin to sing and write songs and hear the sound of the instrument. And, but man, it took a lot of practice, even a little bit of suffering. And do we really imagine that following Christ and being conformed into his image because this is what we were predestined. You were predestined for this, to be conformed into the image of Jesus. That's God's destiny for us, to look like his son, to live the life and share in the glory of Jesus. Do we really imagine that that's gonna come about by a process less painful than learning to play guitar? When you see him, the Bible says you will be like him. Can you imagine that? No wonder we're here for like a hundred years to practice and try to get this right. No wonder we go through all of the stuff that we go through and because it's like a refiner's fire that burns away the impurities and tests the sincerity and genuineness of our heart and so We suffer and yet we're not shaken because we see the pattern. We know we have been called to imitate our hero, Jesus. I want to be like him. I want my life to look like his. And so there's this this amazing dynamic in Paul's life where he took such courage and comfort in the midst of his own suffering, immense suffering, suffering that we can't imagine. Paul suffered and yet had courage and comfort knowing he was not off course because he was imitating Jesus. This, by the way, is so different from drifting through life aimlessly. Just you know, kind of without a pattern, without a vision. Here's the crazy thing. We're all imitating someone, something. People think they're so original. I remember this kid in the youth group when I first moved here and he just dressed really strange and really different. And it was like his whole effort in life was to show everybody that he was so different than everybody in Petaluma. And we went to this youth camp with a bunch of kids from a different area and they were all dressed like him and he didn't know what to do. He's <laughs> like, shoot, I'm not an original. 
we're all imitating. So, someone was telling me the other day about the origin. Someone was claiming to have invented the high five. I'm like, how would you even know that? I invented the high five. No one in history has ever high fived before me. The point of that, I know that sound, what does that have to do with anything? The po- have you ever thought about how in our celebration and joy we high five people? Why? Where did that come from? We're all imitating someone. We're all imitating a whole lot of things. Paul says, I have a purpose. I know who I'm patterning my life after. It's Jesus. But, but here's the really amazing thing, and I want to spend the rest of our time on this thought because it goes a step further. What's really amazing to me is not that Paul patterns his life after Jesus. That makes sense. Think to every Christian. Even, even the unbeliever goes, church, nah, Jesus, I like him. He's interesting. He's compelling. The life that he lived speaks for itself. But Paul was so committed to this pattern of following Jesus that he could call others to imitate him. That kind of blew my mind this week. That Paul would say over and over and over to people around him, hey, If you want to know what the Christian life is all about, just watch me. Just imitate me. Live how I live. Do what I do. How does that strike you? Maybe let's put it in a little more personal terms. If someone walked up to you today in church and said, hey, how's your walk with God going? Like, oh, I'm struggling in this. It's going okay over here. And they're like, well, if you really want to live the Christian life, Watch me. (laughs) Imitate me. Why are you giggling? (laughs) I think we're sort of laughing because that strikes us as arrogant, right? It's kind of arrogant. Jeez. Paul did it. He was, remember last week we talked about being all in? He was so all in on this Jesus thing that he could actually say to people around him, look at any area of my life if you want to know what it means to follow Christ. I put together a list of scriptures. Uh, I'll flash them up on the screen for you. 1 Corinthians 4. I urge you then, Paul says, be imitators of me. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Philippians 3, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Our own text, 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6 and 7, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 9, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. He says in verse nine, it was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. Hebrews 6, 12, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Hebrews 13, seven, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God and consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. It's just a sample of all of the times and ways and people and places that Paul would go and say, imitate me. You have to remember that the churches that were gathering in those days weren't opening their New Testament leather bound, every translation in the world Bible in order to reference what it meant to be a Christian. It's a brand new message to them. And so Paul shows up on the scene. He tells them the good news about what Jesus has done for them and who he is to them. And he invites them to follow. And those who respond say, okay, what do we do? And Paul would live among them and teach them and instruct them and give to them an example and say, imitate me. Church, this is powerful for so many reasons. One, you've probably heard it said before, and it's true. You may be the only Bible that people ever read. So, so what's all this about? And what's, what's all this for, people will say. And I, I'm, not, 
I don't know if I buy it and I'm not really into it. And along comes someone who claims to believe it. And they watch, don't they? Okay, you're a Christian, huh? Let's see. And admittedly, many times they watch with the scrutiny that is unequal to other people around them because they know the high calling of the standard of what it means to be God's people. That's why Paul says, I was like a father among you, exhorting you, encouraging you, and calling you to walk worthy of God. You represent and bear the name of God, and people who do not know him and don't believe in him and have never seen him will watch your lives and say, let's see. I want to live the kind of life, this is my goal, that I could say to you, ask my wife, talk to my kids, look at my bank account, come to my house, check my internet browser, look at my Netflix history, follow me as I follow Christ. What a tremendous responsibility and what a tremendous privilege. And by the way, when I say I want to be that, I'm not saying that's some special calling for me because I'm a pastor. I'm saying, church, this is what we've been called to as Christians. To imitate and pattern our lives after Christ, to be able to say to those around us, follow me as I follow Christ. And what I love... I love that Paul says that because he doesn't say, I've arrived. In fact, he says the opposite to the Philippians. I've not yet attained. He doesn't say, sit with me and you will see Christ. He says, follow me as I'm following Christ. I'm still reaching. I'm still straining for that high calling and pressing on towards that goal. So, Imitate me, follow in the path that I'm on because that's what we're after. So Paul says to the Thessalonians, you know, in verse one, verse two, verse five, verse 11, you know, you saw for yourself, you experienced, you remember, verse nine, you are witnesses, verse 10. You've seen what it looks like, so imitate me. Two quick things that I want to encourage us in in our imitation, two commitments, and then we'll prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table this morning. Because in this passage, I see two major important commitments to imitate as the people of God in our day. And the first was their commitment to the word of God. Notice that Paul was not suffering, nor were they suffering just for suffering's sake. See, it would be silly to think, well, if the pattern is suffering and Jesus suffered and I'm imitating him, okay, then I guess I have to figure out how to make myself suffer. That's not the point. The point is that for those who are committed to the word of God like they were committed to the word of God, you will, we will suffer. Being misunderstood, being accused of false motives like they were, being accused of being narrow-minded, haters, intolerant, bigoted, outdated, old-fashioned, whatever. For those whose lives are shaped by their commitment to the word of God, for those who find in this the very words of God, a pattern for which we imitate our lives after. Inevitably, there will be conflict. Paul knew that. He knew that he brought the word to them in much conflict, and he knew that they were suffering as a result of their commitment to the word of God. Look at verse 13 and 14 real quickly because Paul joins these two thoughts together. He says, we thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, 
You accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things that your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. So Paul's linking the idea that it was your commitment to the word of God that you received from us that caused you to suffer the way that you did. But that's church, no matter the pressure, no matter the accusation, no matter how it's characterized in our day, I believe that's a commitment we need to renew and make today. We are committed to this as the word of God and we will allow it to be at work in us. We will not be embarrassed by it. We will not be ashamed of it. We will not apologize for it. We believe this. And I don't think that I have to stand up here and go on and on about the pressure that is very real in our day for people to say, really, you believe this every word? You really believe this is God's word and not just some old ancient book that people put together and has maybe some good morals but not a lot of great use beyond that. See, to imitate our lives after Paul, after the church, to be a church in that apostolic tradition is to believe that this is God's word. And secondly, there was a real commitment to God's people to the church. I think that this is something to imitate too. We see Paul expressing his deep love and care and feeling towards this church. He's talking to them, speaking of imitation. He says at one point, I was like a mother to you. At another time, he says, I was like a father to you. How powerfully the impression that parents leave on their children, even for the children that swear they will not be like their parents and grow up and find that they are. It's inescapable, that imitation. But Paul cares for the church in this kind of way. He writes in verse 17 of how he was torn away against his will. He attempted to visit them, but... There were obstacles in the way and the waiting seemed to be unbearable. And so you get the real sense. Here's kind of the the gist of this point. You get the real sense that Paul's life was bound up with theirs and their lives were bound up together with Christ. This is a little bit of a spoiler, but it's already in your Bible anyway. So 1 Thessalonians 3, next week, verse 8 Listen to this statement. Paul says, for now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. Parents, you know this sense. Ah, now I can breathe a sigh of relief. Now I can, I can live knowing that my kids are doing well, knowing that they're solid, knowing that they're safe, knowing that they're Secure, right? That's the sentiment from Paul. He's waiting to hear news and he finally gets the good news and he goes, ah, oh, now we can live because you guys are, you're standing firm, strengthened. What is this kind of love and longing and affection and care and praying and intimate sense of connection where their lives were so wrapped up together? That's what the church was. They really cared about each other in a deep, deep way. And this is what we are called to imitate. And so as we gather around the table this morning as the family of God, may God give us grace again and remind us of the pattern, who we are, whose we are, how we have been called to live. That we might look like this church. That we might look like the believers in Paul's day and even Paul himself as we follow his writings to follow Christ and that ultimately we might look like the Lord himself. 
for this is what he has called us to do. Let's pray.